Welcome back to the Epic Higher Ed Podcast. I'm Dustin Backey and I am the host and this week we have Dante on and Dante was a previous student of mine and we have a really amazing and challenging conversation surrounding the color of his skin and what other students of color have gone through and how the current Black Lives Matter movement and civil rights movement that we're in have impacted them and continue to impact them, as well as some of the types of discrimination that he has actually seen as a student. Uh, We talk a bit about COVID and what that has looked like. And this is just a really amazing interview that you can learn so much from and really get a good insight into some of the challenges that our students of color face. So I'm really excited for you to listen and hear what Dante has to say. He's extremely insightful and I know you will get a lot out of it. And if you're liking this podcast, I humbly ask that you rate and review wherever you're at. It helps spread the word and helps spread these students' message further than I can alone. And so I ask that you help me with that. And also, I would like to ask if you, the listener, have any questions you want to ask a student, email them to me at epichighered at gmail.com and I will ask them to our students. So if there's a question you've always wanted to ask a student but never felt completely comfortable doing it, now is your chance. Enjoy this amazing interview with Dante. All right, welcome back to the Epic Higher Ed podcast. And this week we have quite the treat. Uh, We have Dante here and Dante was a student of mine and someone who's helped me out a lot this summer behind the scenes on some of my own independent pursuits. So I really appreciate him and I appreciate him coming on here to chat with us. How are you, Dante? Doing good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm I'm so stoked. I was really happy that you were you were up for this. Um I know I'm reaching out to contacts and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Dante. So I'd love it if you introduced yourself to our listeners. Yeah. Uh my name is Dante. Uh I'm currently gonna be a senior at Chico State. Uh my major is exercise physiology, but I'm looking at becoming a nurse uh right after I graduate. So I'm kind of like just using this one as a kind of like a backup um, degree. And then my ma- my plan is to be a nurse. So I'm like looking at multiple schools, um, you know, just looking at schools locally. Um, let me see, the kind of schools I'm looking at like SF State, um, San Marcos, um, stuff like that. So that's my ultimate goal. Um, I'm the oldest. <laughs> um, you know, I have a little sister. She's also not little, but she is just turned 19 not too long ago. So she's getting up there. Um, you know, um, I my dad's military, so I'm like, I have a military background. Um, so I've been like pretty much all over the place. So when people ask me where I've been, where I live, it's kind of hard to answer that question mm-hmm. because I don't really have a place or I ne- really don't really have a place like, you know, consider of like living long term um, but I was born in San Antonio Texas and from there I moved to Italy then to Germany and then like kind of now here um, and then been here ever since so I actually didn't know that you lived in Italy and Germany that's really yeah cool. um, so I lived in Italy for about two years and then I lived in Germany about for four okay and so, so I will say like most of my time to- like childhood was overseas and oh so- wow did you pick up languages <laughs> so not as much as like in Italy but in Germany just a little bit yeah but like not enough for me to like communicate yeah um, quite well um and then in high school I was like oh you know let me just go ahead and take German as my language class you know because I already lived in Germany and I like I was like oh you know I could try that it'd be easy for me I was definitely wrong <laughs> <laughs> at least for me it was harder for me to like learn it which is pretty shocking for people since I lived in Germany. You'd think it would be easy, but it was 
it was harder for me for some reason. And just, I, I still, I can't get it. <laughs> for some reason, I can I think was learning a second language is that's pretty much hard for me in general. Um, but hey, I had to do what I kind of had to do to graduate. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned you want to be a nurse, and you're looking at like San Marcos and FF or SF State and if we have any listeners, you would be thrilled to have Dante in your program. Um, but what, what makes you want to be a nurse? Um, a couple of things. Um, I will say like my very, like a very like main reason why is because of my grandmother. Um, she was not necessarily a nurse, but she was like LVN. Um, so kind of like a nurse. Um, so her, because the main reason because of her and I loved how, she like she was always a helpful person she was like she put others before herself and that's like one of the main things I loved about her and just like seeing her coming from work happy and everything just like knowing that she kind of made a difference in someone's life and stuff like that so that, that was the main reason um the second reason was mainly because like in my whole entire family I, there's not really anyone <laughs> in like the medical field type of area so I kind of wanted to be that person who was like stray from everyone else and like on my own path type of thing um so i think they're like the main two reasons and then obviously the, the third reason is like a lot of people see me into the medical field based off my personality and stuff like that so like i think all three of those has kind of led me into nursing um nursing was honestly wasn't my first choice though um being a vet was okay vet was like my very for a short time, I was lit. I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna be in the. I want to be a veterinarian." And then uh, because like I love dogs, dogs is like my. I love dogs so much. Um, but when I was growing up, I didn't know that being a veterinarian I had to deal with like snakes and like <laughs> like anything, anything. Like all like I was like focused. I was like, okay, yeah, like, I'm, I'm gonna take care of like dogs mainly and like maybe cats. Because like, I'm not really a big fan of cats, but like. I could tolerate them. So I was like, oh, it's just gonna be dogs and cats. And then growing up, I was like, oh, I did like snakes and like hamsters and stuff, all the other kind of things. <laughs> like, never mind. And then, so that was my favorite first choice. Um, my second choice was actually being an actual doctor. And I was like, okay, and like, yeah, I could do that too. But then I was like, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of schooling for me. <laughs> I just don't like, you know. I don't think I'd be able to be going to school that long and stuff like that. And so I was like, let me just look at like other career fields. So nurse, nursing was like, obviously the one that I was like looking into and stuff like that. Now I have backups and like, I was looking at x-ray tech as well and cardiovascular tech. So like I have backups, but nursing is definitely my number one. Yeah. Not that you wouldn't make a fantastic doctor, but like you said, I think you have the personality to be a really amazing nurse and <laughs> I mean, you know that over the last year, we've spent a lot of the time in the hospital and it was really the nurses who like made or break our experience and made it either like a great day or a like terrible day. And right. so having people who are like kind and generous and like positive is awesome. And so I think you'd make a really, really great nurse. Thank you. Yeah. So how's summer been? I know you took a couple of summer classes. How did those wind down um so they have it really really well um you know i just there's really nothing to do at the moment this summer so like of course i just decided to like at least try to get ahead of the game and just take some classes that i needed to take or like try to retake and stuff like that for a better grade um so they like went really well um i took two at chico and then i went ahead and took one more at my community college so three in total. Um, and I got an A in all the all three classes. So <laughs> nice definitely, work. Definitely it 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 would definitely help out a lot. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um how did the transition with COVID go for you? <laughs> what was that like? Interesting. Um I know with the like being an exercise physiology major there's a lot of like science classes um that we would have to take and stuff like that so that was definitely like um a definitely a change 
um, for I guess for some people, I, is, it just depends on the person. For me, um, it was a lot harder because I'm I have the I'm more hands on. So like when it comes to experiments and the lab and stuff like that, I have to like be there in person to do it um, to get a cool understanding of it. So like when it transitioned to online, everything was just like you're just pretty much doing the lab experiment online, watching it and doing the doing the reports. It was kind of challenging um for me just because it was like i felt like i was missing something and i just couldn't mm -hmm. for a lot for the most part I, I just couldn't put two and two together when it came to labs and like trying to comprehend and what the professor was saying and stuff like that so that was definitely a challenge for me um i definitely had to work like 10 times harder mm -hmm. um to get the grades I got, uh, which I, I thank goodness I passed all my classes. Um, so like I, I, that was definitely a challenge I would say. Um, but I guess a positive thing of, of the outcome, at least for me, edu like academically, was it kind of forced me to work harder and like to study more and more. Um, because I, I will I will say probably like if I was there at Chico, um, I wouldn't have got the grades I got. Mm. Uh, just because I think I would have been focused more on like hanging out with my friends and, you know, having fun and stuff like that versus just like actually sitting down and like studying and everything. Because with everything being closed for the most part, it was there wasn't really a lot to do. So that kind of hit my mindset into like, okay, well, might as well just study and take your time and stuff like that. So I, so it was like a positive and negative in that aspect and stuff like that. Um, so I, I just, I'm kind of just happy with the grades I got and everything. So I, you know, just, just sticking it through. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, it sounds like, your workload increased a lot. Do you think that was primarily because of like what you said, where you felt like you just kind of needed to work harder at it since you were working at it independently without like able to collaborate with peers and your instructors or were there examples where like instructors really like kind of piled on the workload? Um, that's a good question. For the most part, I feel like, my professors all like um, gave me like the same amount of workload. Uh, in fact, like I think a lot of them were more lenient, just because like we're all we're all new to doing this stuff kind of stuff and like learning online and everything. So I will say like a lot of my professors were more lenient and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't necessarily remember if any of my professors um gave me extra work that i can remember <laughs> um but i will say it it's kind of hard to um not necessarily get in contact with the professors but to like get a clear understanding of what the professor wants with mm. their material, uh, like with their home and stuff like that um you know i there are there always are challenges uh just so happened like one of my challenges was that i wasn't sure if a professor if this is the material that the professor wanted me to submit or not and stuff like that so that was definitely um kind of a headache and this it it was it was not irritating but it was just like more or less stressful it made me a lot more stressed out just because like i'm i'm not there in person to confront you know my professor on ask my professor questions and with everything being online it's like you're just talking to them via, either via zoom or via email and a lot of times that kind of is a problem because you're talking to your professors but you're not trying to be rude but you do like text messages or do emails and stuff like that or even through zoom and not being in person they could myself or my professor could take it the other way, like the way that it wasn't meant to be taken and stuff like that. So I think that I had kind of several issues with that. 
was, um, you know, this email I'm a professor, one thing, but not trying to be rude, but felt like they took it as it being rude and stuff like that. So that was definitely, I guess, a challenge I was having. But that kind of answered the question. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I mean, it's not great that you had that, but that was a great <laughs> answer. Um, with that, it really kind of sounds like the clearer that instructors can make their expectations and materials and due dates and all of that, the easier it is for you to focus more on the material than even like the framework, so to speak. Most definitely. Um, I think if a professor is really, really clear, of course, like in the syllabus and like in the beginning of class, there is less of a chance for there to be any error or like a miscommunication later on um, and stuff like that. So I think that's like one of the big factors that is out there and that needs to hopefully like people could like see and stuff like that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what did some of your professors do that like made really good experiences for you or like what experiences in that transition like went really well that you'd encourage people to do going forward? Um, so I want to shout out you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really liked, um, I'm going to use you as, use that example. If that's okay. <laughs> um, I liked how really how you were open with the zoom hours and everything. And it was like, you, okay, you gave us a set times and everything. Like these are the times are available and you were on there. And it was just like, we could just ask so many questions and not only we could just ask you questions, but we could ask each other questions. So I felt that found that like really helpful um, in a way, just because of like, not only am I getting your opinion and help on it, but I'm also getting classmates opinion mm -hmm. help on it. And that kind of like, in a way, helped me meet new, like make new friends and stuff like that. Yeah. Because like then not only are we talking through Zoom with you, but then like we would exchange numbers and stuff like that. And we're like texting each other and just like, it could be just about homework or anything, or it could just be a casual conversations um, and stuff like that. So like I've, I still keep in contact with pretty much some of the classmates that I've met. So that's awesome. I, yeah. I think that's a worry that a lot of instructors have is that connections are harder to make over zoom mm -hmm. and over these digital spaces. So it's really reassuring to hear that, like here you are examples of making contacts and friends and it can still happen in this digital space. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely it's something that I guess for me, it is one of the things that like I, I struggle, not necessarily struggle with, but scared of just because finding it is for me is different because um, it's one thing if I like attended Chico State as a freshman, but since I'm a transfer student, I feel like it's a lot harder to mm -hmm. find friends and or like people to hang out with and stuff because like you have a lot of people who've been knowing each other for those two or three years before you and you're just coming in as a junior and or as a transfer and just like okay all my friends are at my <laughs> community college or near where I lived and like I'm in a whole new setup so finding people who are like I have stuff in common with is gonna be a lot harder because everyone's already in their groups gotcha. so I, I also so I see myself a lot like going towards people who are kind of the same situation as me um, like who are mostly just transfers and stuff like that because I tend to find those like we're in, we have those in common at least that we like we're both transfers so might as well just stick it out but I I was really surprised on how many people I like became friends with off of like who aren't transfers and who just been there oh. the whole time and stuff like that because so. kind of the groups got dissolved a little bit right yeah oh, interesting so, I haven't even th that's a really interesting perspective I haven't even thought about that <laughs> and I feel like that, that that helped a lot because of the whole I guess like the classroom situation like you know you're you're in a classroom and you're just there's a whole bunch of mix of people like transfers or just been there a lot so that's one thing that helped a lot was because like I was in a in a setting where a lot of there was a 
whole different bunch of people, different grades and stuff like that. And so from there, then like transferring over, we kind of stay connected and it's like, you know, say, what's up? We need help. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. <laughs> so like that. So it's really, it really was a good experience and stuff like that. That's awesome. I'm I'm glad to hear that. Um, related to just digital teaching and learning, anything that you want to see from your instructors this fall? What are you like? What does a good class look like, or what are you hoping? Like, oh, I really hope they do this to make it a better experience. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> um, that's really hard. I. I I can't think of anything right now just because like, I, I can't think of anything on top of my head. Um, I'm sure I'll find something like going along with during the semester. Like, okay, I wish this stuff this happened. Yeah. Um, I guess one thing, I, I mean, I, and I totally understand like it's probably gonna not, it's kind of doable, but I know a lot of professors don't really do it. Um, it was kind of, at least from my experience, I guess for exams and everything, I know like a lot of professors have like timed exams. Um, I know in my, in my experience and everything, I always, I seem to fr always freeze up when it is a time exam. Um, for some reason, I like, I, I probably, a lot of people probably like, well, it's the same way thing as like taking it in class. For some reason, I like this, I freeze when I see just knowing that like, okay, like press gives me a time online and like, okay, you have this like two hours to do it. And then you're just like you're doing your work, but then you're like also have to be like know the time and everything. And within those two hours, you have to like take the exam, but then also submit it. So based off how you get your exam, you had to submit it based off the, how mm -hmm. they want it. And then like you also dealing with like background noise and you're just at home pretty much just doing it. And so for me, I always, I feel one rushed like a lot when it comes to those type of exams. Um, so I guess like, I hope professors do kind of like with the exams, like have it opened and you just print it out. Like I think that's how my uh, chemistry professor did it. Um, she just like opened it up had to let us print it out and then we had until like later that night to turn it in so that way I had like that whole day to like take a breath and I was like okay like actually do the exam and everything without worrying the time and stuff like that um, yeah it almost sounds like you kind of feel like you're being tested on not only the material but your ability to like act under pressure and manage yeah. time yeah. and technology and mm -hmm. I'd hazard to guess that those are not common learning objectives in syllabi <laughs> that we're trying to assess yeah. our students in. Right, and I think like, I also like what it just builds up the stress is because when you're taking the exam online, a whole bunch of stuff, anything could happen. Like your computer could have died or like you lost service and everything. So, or your printer doesn't work. So just, just a whole bunch of factors could play into that time and everything and then you're not only stressing about okay you have to submit your you had to finish your exam by this time but you're also worried about okay like or stressing out how to fix your computer or like and just all those type of things just build up the stress and everything and I mean a lot of people I know some people who could work under stress and just do very well um, it's just, I'm not one of those people like when it comes to stress and if something happens and builds up stress I lose all focus um, and it's just, it goes downhill from there for me at least. And it's just like, oh my gosh, like I, I'm not going to do well. And then that mindset just is on throughout the whole exam and just, it gets to a point where I just like, you know, <laughs> I give up, you know, and I know that's not like a good mindset to have, but it, it's just one of those mindsets that I know I need to work on. And stuff. Why do those tests feel like they come with so much pressure? I think just because a lot of professors just want to make sure I which is, I guess is where I, I understand where they're coming from is because when you're giving a set time and everything, 
um, especially nowadays uh, with like COVID going on, you don't have any chance of like time to like cheat um, where you're like communicating with people in your classroom or class and saying, oh, what you get this answer, like switch, change the answers and everything. And I'm pretty sure like, I'm like, <laughs> like 95% positive. A lot of people were doing that during the, mm-hmm. during when I was at home and stuff like that. But I think that's like the main reason that a lot of teachers give time tests is because it's like they, they want you to do the exam based off what you know and stuff like that or what you learned and stuff like that and that should be enough time for you to take it if you've been studying and so i think that's why i not think but i think i know that's a lot of reason why a lot of professors do time exams is because they it decreases the risk of like the cheating and helping each other out and stuff like that yeah what do you feel are some of the like what could go wrong like failing that test because right it sounds like you're motivated to perform well on it and that might play into the pressure you're feeling (laughs) um that's a good question too gosh um what motivates me it's just for me it's a lot of not necessarily the cheating for me. I think it is just necessary. Like I just see the clock coming down, and when I looked at at the exam, although like I you know study a lot, it kind of is like it throws me back a lot as well. When I see like look at the exam and I'm looking at the questions, and it's not at all what the study guide like consists of Mm -hmm. and everything and so that like kind of throws me off is like oh my gosh like I don't remember doing this part or doing this example on the study guide or I don't remember learning this and so doing that a lot of that is like whoa okay hold up (laughs) like is this exam even what I've learned and everything so I that I think that's where at least my stress comes into play Um, okay it's the sometimes the study guide is not the same as the exam. And then when it is, I will say like a lot of professors do say like it, it really is. I get for me, it's like, I'm learning this material on the study guide. I'm expecting it to be on the exam, but there are occasions where the exam consists of problems similar to the of study guide, but in a different way. Like you're not looking for what you were looking in the exam and the exam so you kind of have to change the formula just a little bit into define what you're looking for or stuff like that so like that kind of like throws me off too because i'm always studying like okay this is exactly how you're supposed to look for it in the study guide or in the problem but then when i look at the exam you have me looking for something else and i'm like uh but. yeah i can definitely see how that would <laughs> add pressure and stress during it um So why is it important to you to do well on these tests? Right. Cause Uh, that's got, there's gotta be like, I want to do well. Yeah. And that's part of this pressure. And that's part of the like drive for students to want to cheat is they're like, I need to do well on this test. Like, why do you want to do well on this test? And that might seem as obvious as it sounds, but like. (laughs) Well, for me, it's, it's a lot to deal with trying to impress not necessarily impressed, but like, I, I, you could say impressed, like uh, get approval from my parents and from my, my grandparents mm-hmm. and everything. Um, especially like my grandfather, he is big. He's big on all his grandchildren on like school. And okay. so like, you know, I grew up where like school is the number, is number one. And like, you could hang out with friends and stuff like that later. And I feel like that's where a lot of parents well not a lot of parents most of the parents are like uh i feel like that kind of has to deal with me being my cut with my color i feel like that's where it comes into play is because like one i am an african-american um male and school and like i feel like we being african-american i had to work 10 times harder Hmm. 
to get to where someone else is. And so that's where like my, that's why my granddad is like so big on, uh, on his grandkids about like education, education, Mm -hmm. education and stuff like that. So for me, it's like, I always need to make sure one that I'm doing the best I can do, but also to also impress or not impress, but get the approval of my parents and my grandparents and stuff like that. And I know they, like, they, regardless of what I get and everything, they will love me either way. But it's just that, like, that mindset, like, okay, like, I need to get, I need to get this grade. Like, this is the ultimate grade I need to get. Like, I cannot fail again this grade. And especially in the career field I'm leading to, it's, is I have to get a good grade or else I won't be able to get into any programs I want to get into. Yeah. It sounds like there's a lot of real reasons to need to do well on a test beyond just, I need these points, right? Family, yeah. family pressures, societal pressures, right? Uh, career pressures. So I, I think that's really insightful for instructors to think about how many of your instructors do you think recognized that you felt that way coming into exams or might say Dante as an African American man feels like he needs to perform better to be on par or like to justify his place here. Like how many of your instructors do you think recognize that that's how you feel coming into exams or approaching your grades? It's hard to say um, because it it's it's just, it's really hard to say with coming to a school. I mean, like Chico State is I I think is really good in education and everything, um, but going into a school where majority of it, it are ca- ca- Caucasians and stuff like that, it's it's different. Um, I don't necessarily know if anyone, like, if any professors, like, see, like, oh, that, you know, he's an African-American, like, he needs to work 10 times harder type of thing, or gives that, have that mindset. Um, I honestly think that most of them just think that we're just, you know, another, another student. Um, so I don't think a little, a lot, like, a lot of professors put into play about, their back people's background or where they came from and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I may be wrong. Um, it's just from my, what, from my experience, I haven't really uh, met any professors who like kind of understand where um, the, all the hard work and everything and where I'm from is comes into play. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, I guess the only like the closest would be like I have had some African American professors and like I, for some reason it I think they're the ones that kind of understand you know what like how where we come where we come from and stuff like and how hard we had to work so I do kind of see that um, but like overall it's just I don't think a lot of professors really understand that or like taking consideration of the student's background and stuff like that and where, why certain students have to work hard and stuff like that. Cause you know, we're, I think everyone's trying to be go somewhere in life and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I just, that's like that, that guy. No, I think that's really great. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate you sharing that. And it really sounds like this background of who you are as an African-American man absolutely plays into your studies and your learning experience on kind of a day-to-day basis. And it, we can't separate your learning out from that, right? It's part of who you are. And I think it's important for instructors to take that into consideration. Um, what can, what can we as instructors do to help better understand or even just, understand enough to like act with compassion and understand like 
this is how Dante feels coming into a test. I, I know I'm saying Dante, but students in general, right? The student next to you might be bringing in other things that apply to her. And there's more than just this test here. Like, what can we do to better understand, like, who our students are? Um, well, at the moment, I can't think of anything. <laughs> but you can get back to me later on. I'll probably I can think of yeah. some stuff. Um, but I literally can't think of anything. It's just, it's really, it's really, well, at least for me, it it kind of throws me back when I see a lot of, um, and it happens to me a lot, where I know the material and I, I'm like, I, I'm spot on. And then when I'm helping someone else understand the material and we turn in the same assignment, hmm. they get a better grade than I am, but yet they, you, they help, I help them out in a way. So I, that gives me a lot of frustration. It's like that kind of puts in a role where, or puts me in the mindset. It's like, okay, hold up, wait a minute. Is it, is my professor giving me this grade based off of my skin color or what? So a lot of like those type of, dis- of decisions that are made piss. Oh, I, I feel like a lot of people, my color into that mindset is because it's like, how is it someone else, not my skin color, get a better grade and they don't understand the material, but yet I understand the material and I didn't get a better grade or good as a good grade or get a higher grade than them in it. So I, that's, I want to say like, is probably one of the main factors. Uh, I feel like a lot of people, my color, like go through is this, that, and then it's kind of the, um, kind of not necessarily lightweight discrimination and stuff like that, because I feel like a lot of people assume that, we like black people are ghetto and um, don't know what they're saying and stuff like that are below just because of our past. Um, and I th- that's one thing I think of. Um, and then another one would be what people see in movies. Because if you look at, if you see them look, uh, watch movies and everything, you'll see when it, there's people or when it consists of like the ghetto or stuff like that, majority of them are African-American. And so I feel like a lot of people looking at those aspects and stuff like that, pays them their mind to like, Oh, you know, they act ghetto when we raise our voice or when we act a certain way, they're like, Oh, they're all ghetto and stuff like that. And in a lot of cases, that's not true. Um, that a lot of cases, we're just trying to give our point, cross and how we feel and everything but yet how are we supposed to get our point across when people are, are assuming that we're ghetto or like all that and stuff like that so i that's a i will say that's like a really a hard challenge that i also have through is because like i guess that kind of plays into communicating with people is because we have to find a way to communicate without acting this stereotype black person Mm. um, and stuff like that. That's both. (laughs) All of that is remarkably frustrating. I can't imagine how remarkably frustrating that would feel. And, um, I, it leaves me just, frustrated for you and I know like (laughs) that's not my place to be frustrated for you but I am frustrated for you and other students of color um I think like you said communication is is a is a good route um to starting in terms of starting to kind of break up these biases that we might like internally hold. And it, it sounds like even from what you were saying, these biases might not be, what is it? Uh, conscious, right? We're seeing it in the media. We're seeing it in movies and TVs and these depictions that may not be 
accurate to an entire population of people and we can't assign that to them. Mm-hmm. Um, has, have any of your professors ever made you, bes- that weren't African American, have any of them ever made you feel like they at least kind of understand or like feel more comfortable in their class with those sort of things or maybe they don't understand but they respect that like you have a different background um yeah actually um you know i there's a there are like there are professors out there who i feel like understand like they they consider the background of their students uh no matter what skin color they are and everything um and you could just kind of see that just by the way that they interact with their Mm -hmm. students um um by not just like having favorites or like because you could honestly like students can honestly tell when there's a favorite in the class and right. stuff like that or if a professor is leaning towards a certain group of people and stuff like that students can tell um so when i see like a lot of professors interacting with all, all their students and like um you know having friendly conversations and stuff like that just to have fun like to learn and stuff like that it really is something like i'd like to see um and then also like seeing um I've seen professors like interact with um, BSU, the Black Student Union and stuff like that. So when I see like professors who aren't African-American interacting with, um, you know, organizations like that, like BSU or like clubs like BSU or other organizations that consist of like, like Black Lives Matter or, or like for Latinos and stuff like that, um, you know, uh, I, I adore them like, cause <laughs> they, yeah. they, they, I feel like is the correct step into getting this, you know, country to be equal in a way, mm-hmm. like for everyone to be on the same playing field versus, you know, Caucasians being up here and Latinos and color people being down here and stuff like that. So, uh, I'd see a lot of prof- that's where I I actually see a lot of professors going to and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I'm happy that there are professors out there who do that. Yeah. That's, that's really reassuring to hear because every campus has things like the black student union and, um, I mean, I don't even, (laughs) I I just appreciate this insight so much and you sharing all of this that has my mind whirling and like my heart aching. (laughs) Um, But what, how could instructors get involved with that? Um, I, I could imagine, I mean, even me where I don't know why, but I feel like if I were to like walk into the BSU and be like, Hey, I want to be a part of this. And here I am this like big white heterosexual male, like, (laughs) and all, all that goes along with that, that they'd be like, why, like, what's your real reason for wanting to be here rather than just like even wanting to, you know, show support for students of color and, or better my relationships or, engagement with those students and like coming out from a really honest intentional spot there's this worry that like are people going to think like why am i what's my real reason for being right. there and is that and that might be a you know rooted in some inherent bias that i have and like i'd love it if you called me out on it or be like <laughs> you're being stupid um cuz that's part of what this is for me and um i'm hoping to echo maybe what other people might be feeling too, but. Yeah. Um, for that, it, it is, I will say it is pretty hard uh, to find a way to not be biased and like not to like, um, what's the word? To incorporate yourself into, you know, 
stuff like that because I'm not gonna lie <laughs> if I see a, a Caucasian head like come into a black screen I'm like like what's your reason why and stuff like that and I mm-hmm. I feel like for everyone it's gonna be like that um, because uh, when it comes to that a lot of people don't really understand the whole what African Americans been through um, I know like a lot of people know about like of slavery and stuff like that, but it's they don't understand what <laughs> we had to go through and everything and step by step and what my ancestors had to do to get us to get here to where I am now and what I still have to do to get to where I want to be um, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So it, it's really hard. I will say it is probably going to be like it's hard for professors to like kind of incorporate themselves and like help out and stuff like that. Um, I guess as my best opinion would probably be like, um, you know, just to, you know, be more involved with um, like Black Lives Matter and um, stuff outside that out of school and stuff like that. Or just like, uh, I would say like keep in touch with people who aren't the same skin color as you and stuff like that, just because by doing those little small things, people will pick up on that. And like a lot of people, and um, especially my color, um, we, we, we see it, you know, we see how people, how we've been treated. We see other people, how other people be treated. So like just doing like small gestures like that or, and stuff like that. Um, I will say also like during like classrooms with a lot of people, interact with everyone and um, stuff like that because that's ultimately how you're going to kind of gain the trust of someone and stuff like that and not lead into those biased remarks and stuff like all yeah. that. So. Those are great suggestions and one of the things I think I realized while you were saying that is like there's so much systemic racism just kind of built in like it's not an easy thing to fix and if it were an easy thing to fix like i would hope that it would be fixed so like maybe it's okay that it feels hard to do that right mm-hmm. and h- hard things are worth it um and so that i appreciate that insight and like <sighs> what else can instructors do? Like, um, are there any, like anything that people can do in their classes to better support or even just beyond just interacting with everyone? I think that's a great first start, right? That's a, that's an easy to implement one, right? Like call on all hands and talk with all tables. And, um, but is there anything else that comes to mind that you wish more of your instructors would do? Um, that's kind of, not that, not like a top of my head. Uh, yeah. I can't really think of it. I'm sure like, if you ask my sister she would like have a whole bunch of things like people could do that because she's really big into black lives matter and stuff like that and um into the march and stuff like so that's a question that definitely my sister would be able to answer yeah but i guess like one thing that i do wish like and that i guess like history professors um would do would be more or less talk about slavery so that way, um, you know, people all understand exactly what was going on and like how we were treated. Because I feel like it's in the history department, when there's not in like history classes, there's not really a lot talked about that. Like hmm. it's, it's tend to be skipped over. Um, and I know especially in high school, it kind of like it kind of frustrated me because it was like. I feel like that is a significant mark, you know, that we need to, like, that everyone should be aware of that needs to be talked about um, and stuff like that. But seeing it just being like briefly talked about just for a day or just for five minutes and then just go on to the next, you know, part is just like, 
it's just like really like <laughs> yeah seriously and kind of stuff so i guess that's one thing at least for the history department that i kind of wish you know that could happen um, especially during like um black history month yeah. like, i feel like definitely during black history month there should be some type of um way where we could teach the students black history of course and stuff like that because like a lot not a lot of people know about like black inventors and stuff like that and what they've done and, and all that kind of stuff and and i will say with how we are like if it wasn't for african-americans for like at least half of what we have today or not half but like a quarter because you know i feel like everyone's been done something to where this is how we are today but what like what about 25 percent or even more um what's been created and stuff like that is from black inventors or from you know black people and stuff like that so i feel like definitely like there should be some type of way where we can incorporate incorporate black history and like slavery and stuff like that so that way everyone is aware of um it versus just knowing you know black people and stuff like that because honestly i've learned every all that kind of stuff from my family and everything and from watching like slavery movies and um <laughs> having my granddad uh and my parents having my sister and i write reports about black inventors like a, once a week and everything during Black History Month when we had to write reports on like Black inventors and stuff like that. And so that was a very eye-opening right there. And I feel like not a lot of people know about that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be a really fun emphasis yeah. to, so. to see more of that. that. Those are great suggestions, Dante. Thank you. Um, so what, how has this, the current like Black Lives Matter and really the civil rights movement that we are in the middle of how has that impacted you as a student? And I know a lot of it has gone on over the summer, but we definitely started to see um, things start kind of towards the end of last semester. And obviously the conversation is nowhere near done and we're about to dive into a new semester. So how has, how has this movement really affected you as a student? Um, it it both really it, it, it's funny because it like it I feel like two different ways it surprises me but at the same time it doesn't surprise me um, it surprises me because it's like wow like you know how can people be like that or do that kind of stuff and get away with it but then at the same time it doesn't surprise me because it's like you know it's because of my skin color and like we've been through this multiple times and yet nothing has really changed type of thing um but i will say like the with everything with that's been going on i'm really kind of happy i'm really happy that like there's a we have a lot of support um you know like base there's multiple people out with different skin colors um you know ethnicity race um you know, all out there just defending just Black Lives Matter type of movement and everything. And uh, I've, I'm really happy in a way that turned out and stuff like that. Um, it's kind of sad how the reason, main reason why we've done it, you know, because of George Floyd and stuff like that, um, and Breonna Taylor. Um, but I'm happy that, you know, I guess more people are being more aware of it. Um, I will say that it's going to be, it's not just going to take over a day or a month or a year, um, but I'm kind of happy we're kind of moving into that direction and stuff like that. Um, so for me as being a student, it's just, you know, it, it gets to the point where you get tired of it and stuff like that. And like, um, I know, and for some of my cases is like, you know, I'm getting tired of being treated differently based off of my skin color. And now I'm about to just like, I've been holding my tongue for so long, but now, you know, I'm sick of it. And I, I need to voice my opinion, my concerns and stuff like that. And 
Like, I'm not just going to have you just walk away from it. You're going to listen to it um, type of thing. And so that, that's where I guess me as a student is, is leading towards is like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have it. Like I'm, I'm going to be, a stu- I'm the same student as all these other students. Like I'm here for my education. Like I am going to make sure like, you know, my work and like, this is my work. This is, um, I deserve this grade. Like I'm not going to let anyone let me down based off of my skin color and stuff like that. So um, that's where, you know, I'm leaning to towards with my education and me being a student because it's like to the point now where like, I'm not going to let anyone take away from all I've learned and who I become and stuff like that. And I'm not going to be mistreated as well um, based off my skin color or be treated in any type of way and stuff like that. And I'm very strong on like treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, and I will stick to it at and stuff like that. So like, yeah, like I'm, if, I, I'm glad you are ready to do that. And yeah. And I think it, <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's heartbreaking that it came to this. Um, if if one of your instructors or if an instructor in general just wanted to kind of open the conversation with a African American student or a student of color on like, hey, I want just kind of a better I want to try to get a better understanding of like who you are and how your skin color has impacted you in life and academics and like highlight kind of some of my own internal biases and start to break those down so I could better support you. Um, What are ways that they can start that conversation or start that process Uh, or should they even, is it even your professor's right or like place to come up and be like, Hey Dante, I see that you're African American. Can you help me break down my own internal bias? Like, right. That's my responsibility, not yours. Um, but like, I, I, I don't think like, it, yes, it is my own individual responsibility to recognize my own internal biases and where they're coming out and work to break those down. But I also need help, right? If, if I'm not seeing where it's happening and if I am trying to be good and kind and dropping microaggressions everywhere without realizing it, how can how can an instructor who wants to improve that kind of start that conversation or start that process? Um, that, (laughs) that's pretty hard. Um, because that situation always probably about like 80% of the time leaning to kind of like racism and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and it always depends on how you approach it. Um, and, you know, and with that type of, when trying to, I will say, I, let's put it this, it, for us, it's like, we, we could, I'm sure people will understand, but can you really understand? And stuff like that, it's like, you would never really understand everything that we've gone, gone through and will continue to go through if nothing changes and stuff like that. But at the same time, we do want people to know exactly how we feel. So it, it, it's kind of hard. Um, I, I will say that there's probably won't be any easy way for people to kind of like get into that topic because there's always going to be some type of disagreement or butting heads and stuff like that. Um, but I, I will probably say like, and hopefully like everyone will see it, like will agree with me. It just, you know, to start off the conversation light, you know, um, you know, start off with like, how was your day? And then just like ease on into it. Um, that would probably be the best way um, and stuff like that. Uh, there's really no answer. I feel like to, for that uh, because it, regardless i i feel like it's still going to be is a hard topic to talk about yeah. um, and stuff like that because it depending on the person that you're going you're talking with um it may go right or it may go left so like you know you never know it, yeah 
with how the conversation goes with but I, I would just say this kind of be mindful of you know what you're going to talk about and stuff like that it it is really hard to like discuss you know um that kind of stuff um also i listening would probably be a really big thing is um if you people if professors want to interact with their students of color um you know just listen and just kind of get a, get an understanding of where they're coming from um you know you probably would never understand where they're coming from but at least imagine where they're coming from and stuff like that and and just have that um that communication because i think that would lead into a better um a relationship between the student and the professor because then I feel like the student will, um, you know, have more trust in the professor and um, go to the professor more and stuff like that and stuff like that. And so, yeah, yeah, it's no really, no really easy answer. Yeah, and I, I'm not <laughs> saying that there needs to be an easy one, right? Um, and it, it kind of sounds like just based on your experience, a lot of discussions around the color of your skin and race and tend not to go well right you said like 80 yeah. percent of these things end up in racist remarks and things like that so it sounds like when someone approaches you on that you're initially defensive like oh. i need to protect myself i need to be ready to stand up for myself i need to just like you go into defensive mode which is never a great way to like have an open and like um vulnerable conversation right which is what these conversations need to be and it sounds like there needs to be trust there and like you were kind of getting that there at the end that maybe if there's not trust it shouldn't even happen right you need to establish that trust and care mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree i feel like uh before a professor you know approaches a student um based off their color and everything i definitely feel like there needs to be some type of um trust or like it doesn't have to be a lot of trust either you know it could be just a, some uh, like a smaller trust but just have some trust there to like open up and you know so that way that person could tell you their like how they feel and their understandings of where they came from and stuff like that because i probably guarantee you that if so if, if the professor just comes up to me and just asks me you know why like wants to know more based off my skin color like how what i've been through i have look at them sideways <laughs> i know i hardly look at them sideways <laughs> like why you care like why you want to know stuff like that so yeah. like i i feel like a lot of professors if they want to know that kind of stuff they have to have that kind of student teacher bond and everything and there has to be that, that respect there as well and stuff like that in order for, if you want to get into those type of conversations. Yeah. How about from like a peer perspective or a student perspective of, um, you know, we're getting back together in classes and the black lives matter movement is going strong and a student is like, Hey, I want to better understand mm -hmm. your background and obviously not, completely understand but i want to better understand it and know how like how can i support you dante like how should students approach these well kind of i would say i would at least start off with like well if you like if people well i would say like if you want to understand where we you know our background and everything first watch like um black movies that's what i would say like black movies that mm -hmm. consist of their slavery and stuff like that or like discrimination like if you watch those type of movies, you will get mostly the general idea of, you know, what being African American is and like what we've been through and everything. And I, that what I would say first. Um, and then if you want to continue to like uh, get understanding, then I would say just join or like you know, um, you know, join Black Lives Matter. Like do something to if you don't want this stuff to happen, do something to help stop it and stuff like that. Because closed mouths don't get fed. <laughs> and, and that's what a lot of people say. Like, that's what I get from my grandparents. Like, um, closed mouths don't get fed. So I see a lot of people who want to, who will say to me or like, kind of like 
stand there and like, oh, I don't want this to happen. Like, why is it still happening? But yeah, they don't do anything. Mm. So, um, so if a peer comes up to me, that, I guess it would be the first thing I would say is like, you know, again, like you would never really understand, you know, what my people have been through. But if you want to get a general idea, I suggest you, you know, watch some black movies like slavery movies or discrimination movies and stuff like that, because that will give you a general idea of what, how we've been treated and what we've been through. And then from there, if you still want to know, just we could get into that conversation um, and stuff like that. Uh, because I feel like a lot of people aren't really doing that. <laughs> yeah. um, like they just saying that like we understand or stuff like that, but like, do you really understand and stuff like that? Um, now I, I personally, cause I, you know, I'm 21. Uh, <laughs> I don't really still have a clear understanding of how my ancestors went through with through slavery or through discrimination. And when, um, back when like Martin Luther King was alive and how, it was segregated and stuff like that. I, I don't understand because I was never there. Uh, but now today where, you know, there's being affected by my skin color, you know, I, I, I get at least a taste of it and stuff like that. And uh, I have a, a more of an understanding of how my ancestors, you know, been through than, you know, kind of anyone else and stuff like that. So, yeah. Dante, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. And that is, it's heart wrenching and vulnerable. And I, I just am so appreciative that you were willing to share all of that and be vulnerable like that. Um, and I think that does at least kind of help people have some sense of like, wow, this is what Dante went through. I wonder what other students of color have gone through or like similar experiences. And um, just before we start shifting the topic to uh, I feel like we could keep talking for a really long time, <laughs> um, but I don't know how long people would want to listen to an episode. Um, is there anything else you want to say or that's on your mind or regarding um, like black lives matter and the color of your skin and academics? I will say, like, if you're like, interested in, like, you know, trying to make a change and you want to make a change, I definitely suggest, like, do something, like, do something about it. Like, you, you, just you by saying that you want to help make a change and everything is it, all great and everything, but we definitely need, like, a lot more people out there, you know, to either protest or to, you know, um, donate to these uh, organizations and stuff like that, like Black Lives Matter organizations and stuff like that. Um, voice your opinion um, and stuff like that. And, you know, don't just stay quiet, I would say, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what I will say, if you voice your opinion, make sure it's, don't go over and beyond and everything. Don't act like, you know, you really have a true understanding and everything because you will be called out on it. Um, so I, I will say that kind of, you know, if, if, you, if people want to make a change and help out and stuff like that, that would definitely be the right step. Thank you. I think those are, that's a great starting <laughs> place that people can totally take action on right out the gate. Um, just thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate you. Um, I know before we got on this call, you were telling me about your fall schedule and it sounds pretty daunting and yeah. <laughs> uh, you're you're gonna be moving back up towards chico here here soon what are are all of your classes online and you're just coming to be in chico or are you do you have some on, on campus or what's your schedule uh, look like so for the most part all my class except for two are all online i have two classes that require me to be in person um, so that will definitely be interesting um, to see <laughs> and how that's going to work out. Um, but I will say, yeah, it, this semester is going to be pretty much, I will say probably the hardest semester that I have to go through at Chico. Simply um, on the topics you're taking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let alone the global pandemic and so on. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like, I will say this fall will probably be the toughest, but I, I really believe I could, I could do it and, and everything. So I've, 
I, well, I know a lot of people have more faith than me, but I'm like, oh, thank you. But um, yeah, I, I have two classes that require me to be in person. Um, one class is on Tuesdays and the other one's on Wednesdays. Um, but for the most part, I'm going to be in my apartment <laughs> yeah. um, until things kind of get better and stuff. Will you like be living that. with roommates and friends or? Um, uh, so that was a tricky, <laughs> tricky um, situation. Um, ultimately, I am in a be- two bedroom, two bathroom apartment. Uh, as far as my roommate goes, uh, I've been assigned a roommate, but when communicating that roommate, it kind of, I've been told that he, that person already has roommates and everything. So at this point, I'm like, it's up in the air. I, I don't know if I mm. am going, who am I, if I'm even going to have a roommate or if I'm just going to have the apartment to myself type of thing. Oh, um, interesting. So that, yeah, that would definitely be interesting. Um, so I probably won't find out about my roommate situation until I move in. Uh, um, and that's not an on-campus, that's an like off-campus apartment situation? Mm-hmm. Yes. So, okay. so that will be definitely interesting to see on when I move there and yeah. stuff like that. Are you yeah. feeling comfortable coming back to campus and those on cl- campus classes? Are you glad to be setting foot on campus or are you, where are you at with that? <laughs> I will, <laughs> well, that's funny because a part of me is excited to head back. Another part of me just doesn't want to set, head back just because I feel like a lot of students that attend Chico don't live in Chico. So like, I mm-hmm. felt like a lot of students is either live in Sacramento or in the Bay area or San Diego, LA, like a lot of students, that's where I feel like a lot of students that go to Chico live. So when moving, so having everyone come back, I feel like it's kind of a way of disaster. That's just my opinion. <laughs> like just because like a lot of people are coming from different places and everything, and you don't already don't know what they have and stuff like that. So just putting everyone back into school and going in person. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> I honestly don't know how it's going to And I'd like our listeners to know that the CSU, the California state system, has probably taken some of the more aggressive stances to not having students on campus. And we have a very limited, I think, something like 9% of classes were approved to be hybrid. So you come to like campus one time a week, not even like every time. So this coming from a student who's in one of the best feeling <laughs> a bit nervous and like it's a bad idea um, yeah, so if it was up to me i would have stayed in like my i would have stayed in my room and just done all my like assignment like all my classes online but since you know there are since you know there are some classes that i have to go back to um i have no choice unless i want to drop the class but if i drop the class you know first me back and get my degree and I'm not trying to have that. So um, it's just, we'll, we'll see. I I think, I don't know if everyone will be, because, um, you know, if you look at the news, there are people who really don't care about what's going on. But for those who do care, you know, it will be interesting how they would, they're going to react and see. Um, I'm sure a lot of parents are pretty much happy for those their kids that they don't have to go back and everything and because stay home and take a class and i mean i i I will say good luck to us those of us that will that need to go back and stuff like that and see and we'll see how that goes (laughs) yeah yeah i I hope it goes well i I sincerely do (laughs) um and uh, just to kind of wrap us up on a good note or uh easy kind of lightweight note um (laughs) I like to just ask students, like, if there was one resource that you would recommend to every other student or one, one recommendation, it could be something you could buy, something you can do, something you could watch, something you just one thing, what would it be? What is <laughs> one thing you'd recommend to every student out there or every listener out there? You know? <laughs> uh, that's hard. <laughs> I can't. Um. Mm. 
I really can't really say much because I was going to say like, you know, maybe work out and everything. I don't know, do something active, but I can't really say that because I haven't even been active. Um, I have been like a couch potato ever since I've been home. Um, I'm pretty sure I gained so much weight. Uh, I'd be eating ice cream, um, a whole bunch of junk food. So that's just, that's just me. Like, you know, um, Got yourself some slack, right? Global pandemic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that? Uh, well, it's just funny because like er, my family, they're all athletic. Like they all are gym oriented. Like they run in the morning. Like my parents will wake up at four or five o'clock in the morning to exercise and go running. And then after work, we'll do the same thing. My sister is a runner and stuff like that. I'm the one that just like my exercise is walking from the bedroom to the um, to the refrigerator back. That's my exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess the one thing I could tell students is, uh, I guess, as a positive note, just um, don't let anyone kill your dream. I, I guess I'll say, uh, you know, if you want to do something, go for it. Like, don't let anyone. Um, stop you from doing it and I know a lot of people really I hear that a lot but I, I really I take that to heart and I hope people can take that heart to heart too because it's like don't let anyone tell you different you know do what makes you happy and um, yeah you know um, because ultimately you're going to be the one doing it and that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. Thank you, Dante. And I just want to say again, thank you so much for being here and being open and vulnerable and willing to share and willing to put up with me. I, I just appreciate you so much. Good. Thank you for having me. It was a great experience. I'm glad that we had this talk and everything. And hopefully a lot of people could listen to it and just get their like understanding and and all that kind of sense and stuff like that so i hope so too all right dante i'm gonna close us off here okay <laughs> thank you so much